This episode of Tales from the Crypt is sponsored by the Cash App. You freaks already know all about them. They're helping us stack sats. They've also been the number one finance app in the App Store for the last two years. They're the first peer-to-peer payments app to allow you freaks to buy Bitcoin. It's the easiest way in the U.S., uh, in my opinion. No more having to wait five days for your ACH transfer to come through. Uh, with Cash App, you can buy Bitcoin instantly. And then when you're ready to take full ownership, when you are comfortable taking possession of your UTXOs and custodying your own private keys just use the cash app to scan an external wallet's qr code and send your bitcoin off or you can copy and paste the address into the cash app uh, and take custody of your own bitcoin cash app also comes with standard banking features like direct deposits other things that your bank doesn't offer like the boost program the cash card which is customizable um, and comes with the boost program you helps you instantly save anytime you use it at Lyft, Whole Foods, Chipotle, Chick-fil-A, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, local coffee shops, which is my favorite. I used it two hours ago down the street uh, and saved a dollar. Download the Cash App today from the App Store, Google Play Store Freaks, and keep stacking sats. <laughs> from the cream. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent here on a cold, dreary Friday morning in early May, sitting down with a fellow beefy Bitcoin boy. Very excited for this conversation. Finally have him one-on-one in the studio. I had his brother with him the well, first time he was in the studio. I want to introduce you freaks again to James. I burn James. Welcome back to the pod. What to do, freaks? <laughs> it's good to be back, Marty. It's um, uh, it's a long time coming. Definitely. Definitely. I got to say, it's it's a little disorienting to be sober. Um, on uh tales from the crypt but it's a pleasure to be back uh yeah this pod holds a special place in my heart because um i guess it's the first bitcoin related podcast i ever went on but uh, i distinctly remember listening to the first episode on the way to work um and just being completely floored by your montage Uh, i i I know i owe you freaks another montage we need to do a catch-up the The people demand it marty i know the thing about the montage is you have to write them out. They're like scripts, so I have to write a script for it. Totally. Did you did you do any editing of that after the fact? Like, yeah, that was not one. I tried to do it in one foul swoop, and and you really run out of breath quickly. So what I what I found, it took me like fifty takes. What I found is that you have to do it one sentence at a time and then cut it up. Yeah, it I was together. I was amazed. I was like, yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's a great work of podcasting. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, it's flattering coming from you, a man of your stature. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I promise uh, this episode I'm not going to leave for a pee break in the middle and just leave you on the mic to to riff. Well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll All see. right. We shall see. <laughs> so let's jump into it. It's been almost like a year since we last talked. What the hell's been going on? What have you been working on? We've had, for you freaks that don't know, James and I have actually been talking for like an hour already. We probably should have been recording those conversations, but we'll touch on them again. But let's just get a... Uh, Let's just get a, a checkup on James O'Byrne. How have you been? What's been going on? Yeah, so when we last talked, um, I had just moved to New York. I had just started at Chaincode. And um, for my first few months at Chaincode, I was kind of doing a variety of things. Um, a lot of it revolved around the uh, Bitcoin Optech initiative. And um, uh, basically, it was uh, sort of a process of going around and talking to a bunch of different Bitcoin companies and you know seeing... Um, where they were encountering uh, scaling problems, especially with fees and stuff like that. Um, and uh, that was fun, and, and um, uh, it was definitely instructive in terms of how people are are uh, using Bitcoin and thinking about scaling. Um, and uh, uh, ended up uh, organizing a, a few conferences and um, doing a lot of traveling. But honestly, I'm kind of a hermit by nature, and I'm... Uh, <laughs> I, I consider myself much more of an engineer uh, than sort of a developer evangelist. And so uh, I was kind of eager to just get back in the woodshed and um, start writing code. So uh, right around December, I think I, I kind of decided to um, step back from the Optech stuff for a little while and uh, get back to just writing a lot of Bitcoin core code. Um, and uh, so since then, I've uh, been working on a, a few different things. Um, but uh, I guess we're going to talk about one of them today, which is uh, Assume UTXO. But um, yeah, so in general, just doing a lot of programming, trying to survive New York City, um, <laughs> drinking too much coffee, um, you know, the usual stuff. Well, um, before we jump into Assume UTXO, I just want to thank you and 
the other people on the Bitcoin Optech team for for putting that initiative together. It's uh, it's been incredible. Uh, the the weekly newsletter, David Harding. Shout out to David, doing an incredible job putting that together. I'm loving the uh, the Stack Overflow highlights that have been in in recent weeks and uh, the Beck Thirty Two series that's going on now as well. Um, He's a total gem. I mean, Harding Harding is is irreplaceable. He's one of those people who um, is just a thrill to watch and is is a really kind of unique skill set. Um, you know, like being in in the kind of software industry, it's it's incredibly rare to meet somebody who is able to articulate the ideas as well as David is, as well as um, having you know, as deep a technical understanding as he does. And so he is a complete gem. You know, the presence of, of guys like him and uh, guys like Brian Bishop. I don't, do you know, do you yeah, know yeah. Brian? Kanger, the fastest typer in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And so not only is he the fastest typer in the world, um, perhaps only matched by uh, Lalu's um, uh, speaking s- speech. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's not only the fastest typer in the world, but he has a single markdown file. Um, or maybe a, just a single flat text file where he records every conversation that he has with everybody. What? Yeah. What? So, yeah. Yeah. Every single conversation he has goes into this text file. Um, and I, I got to imagine he's like paraphrasing and stuff. But, um, yeah, he's got a really interesting spiel on it if you ever talk to him. What, um, uh, what's the gist of the spiel? I'm very fascinated about this. Like, I feel like writing... Uh like basically a journal entry a day is hard enough. I can't imagine transcribing the conversations I have after the fact. Either. Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, and your, your, your persistence and dedication with the newsletter constantly amazes me for, for equivalent reasons. But, um, I guess his idea is that he wants to basically cross reference all of the, the stuff that he's talked about with other people and, and maybe find patterns or, um, just be able to to go back and reference, uh, you know, things he was thinking about. I don't want to speak for him. You know, you should you should definitely maybe have him on the pod sometime. But definitely, uh, Brian. Next time you're in New York, we need to sit down. I need to hear about this uh, this practice of transcribing your your conversations after the fact. It's, it's incredible. Like somebody who has six concussions. That's another reason why I write. Like this has to be great for your memory as well. Are all those lacrosse related? No, only one was lacrosse related, believe it or not. I was skateboarding, snowboarding, fell off a top bunk, uh, basketball, a, a litany of, of causes. Man. Really, it really a, threw my body around in my younger, in my youth. Making good use of it. Yeah. That's good. I didn't know you skateboarded. I used to skateboard a lot. Yeah, I was a big skater for a while, uh, especially when we lived in Charleston. Um, actually getting back into it more recently. And, we uh, should go out and skateboard because... I would like to, and when I was in California, actually, I picked it back up, but the problem is that you would go to the skateboard park, and you'd be surrounded by um, these, like, you know, 12-year-olds, all of whom are better than you at skateboarding. Yeah, yeah, we don't go to skate parks anymore. We we just, <laughs> we ride, we, we hop up curbs, we do uh, we do street stuff. Cool, or If cool. we could find, like, a quarter pipe in a driveway, that'd be that'd be ideal as well. But, yeah, yeah sk- going to, I went to a skate park here in Brooklyn, I believe last time it was, like, a year ago. And there's like a lot of pro skaters here in Brooklyn. So you go, I haven't skated, I'm like oh, pushing 30 almost, haven't skated in like a decade and not even a decade. I'm skating like seven years mm-hmm, I'm mm-hmm. trying to get on, get back into the skate. I was like, nope, yeah, this isn't going to work. It's, I, it's a little I ate shit once and I was like, I'm going to go try to do uh 180 ollies on the basketball court. That is exactly what happened to me is I was, <laughs> I was, I was, I was trying to learn to bowl skate and I'd showed up early in the morning to avoid, you know, the, uh, the utter disgrace brought upon me by the 12 year olds. Uh, and I, and I completely ate shit in the bowl and it was the first time in a long time I had felt like sheer blunt pain. Uh, it feels good though. Sometimes it does. You know, there's something cathartic about it for sure. But I was like, I'm kind of an old guy now. I can't, I can't be doing this. Yeah. I've got, um, I get a nephew who's, who's getting into it. I've shown Thrasher videos on Instagram, and he like loves them. We call uh, skateboarder savages, and that's probably what'll push me to get back into skateboarding at some point. Let's do it, buddy. Soon. Let's do it. Let's have a skate date. I'd be in, I'd be down. I gotta Great. get a deck. Um, no, it's I mean skateboarding. It's bring it back to uh, bring it back to Bitcoin in some way. Skateboarding is like uh, something like very ingrained with trial and error, like fail 
try a trick as many times as you can, fail. Seems a lot like the Bitcoin core process as well. Um, like yeah, to get a yeah. <laughs> I, I've never, yeah, I've never kind of thought about it that way, but definitely um, trying to get a PR merged is a lot like trying to Learn grind to down a handrail and like, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> wrecking your body. <laughs> in the process we can always uh, bring it back to bitcoin on this podcast absolutely yeah i think there's some some intellectual equivalence there but um yeah i i mean i bring up brian and and, uh, and david because i think the the presence of those two guys in bitcoin it just tells me that something really special is going on because um you just you 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 can't find these sort of people in any uh large supply all right that's something uh as you meet more bitcoiners and this is we had uh Ruben Waterman, who started this app called Bitter, based out of Europe. It's basically a, a really cool service, non-custodial exchange that allows you to buy Bitcoin. Basically, you set up a banking um, a banking connection with Bitter, with Ruben, and you basically send them money, a set amount of money, and you send him an address to send Bitcoin to. Uh, and you basically send money to his, his exchange, and he sends you Bitcoin within the hour. Mm. And it's never held on the exchange or held in Ruben's custody. He's just buying and facilitating the trade, which is a really cool app. But this is somebody I didn't even know about Bitter until two weeks ago. Didn't even know about Ruben until two weeks ago. He reached out. I was like, I'm going to be in the States. Would love to come talk about Bitter. And met him last night for the first time. And it was just easy to, like, there was already, like, a bootstrapped understanding of, of that we're both into Bitcoin and we're sort of into this world and have this mutual uh sort of mission that we're on it was just like really easy to not sound cheesy but like to vibe with him it was like and he's somebody who's built like an incredible service and just doing it purely out of this is going to make the world better and that's a lot of the bitcoiners that you meet don't want to get cheesy again but it's the feeling you get and like you're just describing it about david and and brian who are who've done incredible things and i've had the pleasure of meeting Actually, I haven't had the pleasure. I've had the pleasure of watching Brian type at Bitcoin <laughs> Politics Honey Badger. <laughs> did not want to, uh, did not want to uh, interrupt him, but that type of dedication to just transcribing uh, presentations so that people on the internet can can get better information is is why are people doing this? Why are people this dedicated to Bitcoin? Is uh, something I I often ask. Yeah, and it, I mean that that kind of activity, that transcription, really lends this like historical weight to what's going on. It makes it feel like, oh man, maybe people are are later going to kind of read back on this stuff. And uh, aside from it being just a huge resource, if you want to Google, you know, uh, Utrexo or you know whatever your 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 topic is that you want to find more more out about. So it's a huge service Brian does. But yeah, in terms of the optech stuff, the other unsung hero there is uh, Steve Lee. Oh yeah, Moneyball baby. Moneyball, yeah. He's um, he is just a, a gem of a man. He's the salt of the earth, um, and he's. I mean, uh, he he was uh, sort of the backbone operationally of Optech for a long time. Um, really, just like uh, I've never seen people use a spreadsheet like Steve can, and um, he 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 did a, a ton of work there. Um, but yeah, the the whole team uh, was great. I I really didn't do that much. I mean, I, I was on hand for. Uh, I don't know some engineering uh, spieling and uh, did some minor organization, but I was really eager to just get back to coding. So let's talk about the coding. Let's talk about assume UTXO. Um, I'm not going to try and describe it because you're here and you know how to describe this much better than me. I guess let's start. What uh, what made you want to attack this problem? How are you attacking it, and what is the feedback up to this point? Because you you sent a message to the mailing list, what, March 15th? So it's been out there for a month and a half now? Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's, that sounds right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like so many things in Bitcoin, it's really not a new idea. Um, people have been talking about it for a while, and in fact, uh, I think I had first heard about it um, in the winter of um, 2017, um, no, maybe 2018. In any case, um, uh, yeah, it, it's kind of funny in Bitcoin, whenever you think you have a new idea, um, just basically search through the mailing list and, you, and you'll find, you know, like <laughs> Peter Todd was talking about it three years ago or something like that. But but in any case, um, uh, I, I had sort of heard about this idea of... Um, 
Well, let, let me back up. Let me let me start talking about it. for a few months. Um, I was kind of doing some performance benchmarking on Bitcoin to try and figure out how we could get some efficiency gains um, during initial block download, which, as the uh, freaks out there may know, is is probably the most onerous part of uh, operating a Bitcoin node in terms of just getting synced with the network um, and validating all the historical blocks and um, getting brought up to speed. You know, that can take, um, I think basically the floor is like that can take uh, four hours, um, but uh, the ceiling is is pretty much unbounded based on your hardware, and your bandwidth. Um, and typically it takes, you know, a few days, maybe on consumer hardware and, and a, a moderate internet connection. So, um, so that's, that's not great. And that's a, a pretty big impediment to um, actually running a full node. So for a while I was, I was, I was kind of like, well, maybe, you know, there, you know, we could, we could flush the caches differently or, you know, we could change some data structure around so that IBD, I don't know, you know, we cut it down by, by 10, 20%. Um, so I spent a lot of time doing some benchmarking and, um, had a few ideas, but, uh, I really thought to myself, like, these are just marginal improvements, you know, a 10, 20% speed up would be nice, but it's, it's not really going to fundamentally, um, change participation in, uh, in running a full node. So, um, you know, we should go back to the drawing board and, and really figure out some kind of fundamental improvement that we can make. So, um, yeah, one of the Bitcoin core meetings, um, the one we had in New York, I think in uh, early 2018, um, this idea of uh, assume UTXO had been mentioned. And um, the basic idea is that uh, in Bitcoin, when you when you do the initial block download, um, you're downloading these, these raw block files in the blockchain, and you're kind of replaying them um, block by block to generate a view of the um, coins that have not yet been spent. And this is, this is basically how, you know, um, this, it's like a quick reference um, for whether or not uh, a coin is spendable. Um, and um, so the idea of assume UTXO is, well, if, if we know at a certain height what that set looks like, um, then maybe we can just forward that to a node that's trying to bootstrap um, and then kind of, um, uh, assume that it's correct, you know, um, with, with, uh, some degree of certainty and then back validate it after a while. Um, and, uh, that would allow someone to, uh, get a full node up and running, um, a heck of a lot more quickly than, than doing a full initial block download. So the obvious objection to this, I, I mean, I guess I should pause and, and let you do the obvious objection, but it's like, yeah, like, you, you know, uh, <laughs> right, right. Right. Like you, you, you I mean, it's not intuitive that you can get something for nothing. So, uh, so what's the the trade that we're making here? Um, and I guess to to articulate that trade, um, we should talk about an existing feature of uh, uh, Bitcoin, which is called Assume Valid. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, with Assume Valid, I think that the thought process was pretty similar here. Like, we need a a substantial speed up to initial block download. Um, and so, uh, what the developers did, I think this, um, this came around in, oh, I won't even try and cite a release number. I think it was 0 0.15, but I'm not sure. Um, so the idea of assume valid is that, um, we specify a certain block hash at a certain height in the code that's, um, that indicates, uh, that we can assume that for any block that we're validating before that block in the chain, that signatures are correct, and, and so we just don't check the signatures. And um, the idea here is, you know, when I when I first heard about this, I was kind of unnerved. I was like, you know, that sounds really fishy. That sounds like something you know you'd, you'd see in Ethereum. Um, but actually, if you stop and think about it for a second, um, it kind of makes sense because Bitcoin Core is a really complicated piece of software. And um, almost nobody understands like the full set of implications of the, the consensus rule set and how it's implemented in C++. So it's actually a really difficult piece of software to review in its entirety. Um, and what something like assume valid allows you to do is uh, it allows you to introduce an optimization like, um, you know, that drastically uh, affects the performance of uh, an initial block download process. 
and it and it does so in a way that makes it really easy for for a pseudo technical user to kind of review that it's it's correct because what you can do is you can take uh you know an existing um bitcoin d instance before there was assume valid and you can say okay you're claiming that basically the software has validated this block well i'm going to i'm going to double check that and so i'm going to run some rpc commands um and check that the hashes match what you're claiming um is uh, is the block that that my software previous, pre previously validated um and so like almost anybody can do that um and uh, uh as a result that security model ends up being a lot easier for um a non developer or a non core developer even uh to verify um uh, does that make any sense or or uh yeah it makes sense to me okay um, yeah i, I can't I, speak for the freaks out there but yeah, so, yeah. Try and try and channel the freak energy, and you know, <laughs> uh, uh, definitely interject because I feel like I just went on a huge monologue. Yeah. So how there. how do you come to agree on what hash gets assumed valid and stuff like that? I guess that's probably where the contention comes in: is who is uh, deciding where to uh, and where to place these assumed valid hashes? How are they determined? Who's determining them? Is it done in a redundant way? Is it done in a, a decentralized way? Is it how much trust is involved? Is probably the main crux of the issue. Yeah, no, that is the crux, um, and I think it's really, really important to understand because almost everybody can actually participate in that process, um, and uh, obviously, the more people who do, the better. Um, so, assume valid uh, and assume UTXO when it, whenever it comes around, if it comes around. Um, are established through the pull request process on um, the Bitcoin Core GitHub repository. And this is the way that any other software change to Bitcoin Core is made. Um, but assume valid is just, uh, you know, uh, it's it's another piece of code, albeit it's, it's a lot simpler. And it's typically updated, um, you know, a few uh, weeks or months before release. But the idea is that somebody, you know, really anybody can propose um, an assume valid update and then um, the way that that pull request is reviewed is is people come online and they say, um, yes, uh, according to my instance of Bitcoin, the uh, block hash at this height is, uh, is, is the hash that you gave or it isn't the hash that you gave. What's going on here? Um, and so because anybody kind of running a, a node at that point can just issue a few RPC commands, they can verify that that, that assume valid values um, uh, actually the right one. And how far back in the chain are you looking to go with these typically? Um, I mean, y y you want them to be buried um, pretty significantly to avoid any, um, you know, reorg that would happen in the wild. But to be honest with you, um, that doesn't have to be very deep. I, I think, you know, typically you might expect a few weeks worth of blocks. Um, I think the thinking being that if you have... A reorgs worth of a few weeks then i mean confidence in the system is 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 probably shot anyway mm -hmm. um, so what's the point um but i think by release time it it like i think in this case we had uh, the last assume valid update at least a month uh before um this this most recent release was cut okay um and this is something that's already implemented and it's already in the wild so yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's node uses assume valid by default. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's th th this security model is already there. But I think it's it's really worth emphasizing. It's a really kind of profound point in my mind that um, this this security this this way of doing optimizations is is good because if you know another route that we could we could go is like um, well I, I shouldn't say another route but. This is a change to the code that's that's easy for anybody to review. Whereas if you're making a really sophisticated change to Bitcoin, there are only a few people who can legitimately review that, and it would it would be really easy to you know, uh, or I'm um, relatively easy uh, compared to something like a constant value to sneak a kind of backdoor into Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so the more of these changes that you can make, kind of simpler and reviewer by a larger set of people, the better. Um, so, so assume valid and ultimately assume UTXO, I think are, 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 are kind of uh, good in that sense. Yeah. You touched on, um, comparing 
comparing this to Ethereum earlier, I guess uh, a lot of people like to compare this to get fast sync or something. How is this different to something like that? Yeah, so I'm not very familiar with get fast sync, but I think get fast sync does um, an analogous thing where they basically uh, retrieve um, like a snapshot of the state tree or you know whatever it is in Ethereum. Um, but crucially, they they don't back validate that snapshot and i'm actually um unfamiliar with with who they retrieve it from and how they retrieve it from and we can get into um how we're how we're planning to do that in assume utxo because it's kind of interesting and i think has some pretty good security properties um but uh fundamentally they they never actually go go through and replay all of the blocks to to validate that the snapshot that they received um, is legitimate. And we actually do that in, in the Assume UTXO proposal. So the way that works is that um, you load one of these UTXO snapshots and um, then you'll have a little bit of syncing to do just to get to the network tip because there might be you know, a few uh, weeks or months um, since uh, the snapshot was actually cut. Um, so you have a little bit of syncing to do, but hopefully that shouldn't take you know more than an hour. Um, but then after that syncing completes, you know, you you have an operational wallet, um, and for, for many purposes, it's it's just sort of a regular Bitcoin node that's that's fully synced and fully validating. But then in the background, um, we're simultaneously doing the initial block download um, for the purposes of uh, getting to the base of where the snapshot started, um, just to check that that everything is good. And so in some ways, this is actually an, um, an improvement on assume valid because we could disable assume valid while we're doing this initial block download in the background um, and actually verify all the signatures if, if you wanted to. I don't, I'm not really sure if there's a strong argument for doing that, um, but you could. And so I guess with the adversarial thinking here, where in this assume UTXO model, in my mind, like, is it most vulnerable like right after the UTXO set or snapshot is cut and then so basically the the attack vector here is assumed attack vector vector is if you're using these these uh assume UTXO and you get the IBD uh done quickly and you wait for the chain to validate in the background is that is before the chain gets validated transactions that you make based off those snapshots have the potential to be fed bad block headers or something Correct. Yep. Yep. So the 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 practical attack here is if you were to download a Bitcoin version that was, say, compiled by someone else or you know from um, um, from some source that isn't Bitcoin dot org, um, and someone had hard coded in um, a specially constructed assume UTXO hash that pointed to um, a UTXO snapshot that they had specifically crafted to say contain you know a coin that wasn't theirs, um, so uh, that would uh, that would be the only way that you could really attack this. Um, and recall that you know if if you if you download an untrusted version of Bitcoin that you either haven't compiled yourself or um, you know that doesn't have uh, Gideon signatures on it, then really any kind of change could be made. So, um, so basically, the the threat model there is is pretty much equivalent to to what we have today. And so there's no trade off. Seems to be some added benefits in sped up IBD. Like, what? How long do you think? Do you do you think as the person who has uh, has proposed this proposal that it has any chance of getting merged in? And if so, what will the process look like? Yeah, I, I think. Um, I think of the longtime contributors that I've talked to, there's uh, there's been pretty good reception so far, and I think the way we're going to approach this is is to do it in slow phases. Um, so to start off with, there's there's a good deal of refactoring work that needs to be done for this um, in order to support the the background validation stuff, and it's refactoring work that honestly we should probably do anyway because it makes the code more testable, a little bit more you know modularized. Um, so um, I've already done a good deal of that, and um, I think we're going to start to I'm going to start to propose that stuff for merge, um, which again are, are kind of good changes in themselves. Um, 
And so um, the first phase of Assume UTXO, if, if it's kind of adopted, is we're going to introduce use of the UTXO snapshots into the RPC interface. So we're not going to transmit snapshots over the network. We're not going to do anything different by default. But if you're a sort of sophisticated user and you want to try out the snapshot stuff, um, then you have the RPC interface to do so. Um, and uh, we're going to hard code the uh, Assume ETXO valid in the code. Um, um, and unlike Assume valid, we're not going to allow you to, to specify that via command line argument because they're, for, for the reason I just kind of described earlier in terms of the attack vector, we really don't want people to, to sort of play around with this Assume ETXO value. Yeah. So I guess another contention that Bitcoiners will have too is that uh, they probably don't want this by default because I believe oh, I'm not going to name names, but I, uh, some people have said that this uh, may lead to some complacency um, in people like just depending on this IBD uh, in mass. But I think if you're downloading the chain, validating the chain in the background, does that make that that argument sort of void? Yeah, it does. I uh, to to a large extent. Um, but I think so that's like, so the RPC thing is, is phase one. Um, and that's going to allow us to really think about this stuff and, and, and give it a lot of time, um, not only to, to sort of uh, be used to some extent in the wild, but, you know, for the, the development community to really stew on it. Um, and then uh, afterwards, uh, the, the next phase of this thing would be actually having every node um, well, maybe not every node, maybe it would be optional, but, um, having nodes generate snapshots and then transmit them over the peer to peer network. So that if you're a node and you want to come online, um, you would connect to the peer to peer network, you would get your chain of headers. Um, and then you would, re you would request, um, the most recent snapshot from your peers. And, um, we've come up with a way that we could do this, which is kind of neat where basically we would split these snapshots into very fine chunks um, and we would use something called erasure coding to um, expand out the snapshots into a slightly larger piece of data that we could split into chunks. But that would allow us to basically um, retrieve the snapshots from all of your different peers um, kind of in a, in a sort of like BitTorrent-esque way where you're reconstructing a single snapshot from a bunch of different pieces of data that you get from all your all your peers, mm -hmm. um, and so that that you know should should not only kind of take some burden off of the network, but you know give you assurance that um, you're not relying on a single peer or, or you can't be dosed by a single peer trying to get a snapshot. It's possible to sibyl this process. Sure, but only so far as like you know you could sibyl a regular Bitcoin node, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you you could easily if if you wanted to to sibyl uh, a, a node coming online um, today uh, you could as long as you feed it a headers headers chain that contains all the existing checkpoints um, which are which are relatively low height so um, there's really no change from that standpoint yeah and I'm just trying to think through adversarially here um, yeah why do you think this is scary for a lot of people. Um, it probably feels like something for nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, it probably feels like, why haven't we done this before? Ethereum's doing this. Um, I just, I'm just having flashbacks to Andres Brecken freaking out the Bitcoin cash team when they, well, this isn't a checkpoint, but like, I think this is what people think of as like Bitcoin cash implementing their checkpoint, like near the chain tip and yeah. being like, we should not be doing anything like that or something. Like yeah. That. And that is truly crazy because that, let's explain why that's crazy and how this is different then. Yeah, so if, <laughs> if 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 you wanted to create a, a hard fork in a chain that was doing checkpointing near the tip, um, then basically you could just do a reorg that's longer than the checkpointing and and uh, and, and really wreak some havoc there. Um, so like we're not, you know, I, I think that's that's very drastic. I think it's worth noting that something like assume UTXO and assume valid they are not r restricting other chains from being valid. They are just saying, hey, you know, in this software project, we previously validated this chain. If, if you want to come up with another like high work chain that, 
um, that, uh, you know, that, that at least includes the checkpoints. We're not going to preclude that on the basis of assume valid or assume UTXO. We're just saying kind of like, uh, as a software project, this is the chain that we've previously validated. Um, so it's, it's unlike checkpointing near the tip which really dictates like, okay, there is a single chain that, that we all trust um, and this is it and anything else isn't valid, mm -hmm. um, which is nuts. And that's, I think it's important to draw distinctions between that, that way of, uh, that way of, I don't want to say checkpointing, like that way of doing things versus a, in assume UTXO model. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what freezes because there's a lot of nuance to this stuff, right? And that's uh, as yeah. Some, and as you were describing earlier, Bitcoin Core repository is a code base that no one man can probably fully understand, and um, it's exceedingly complex. It's yeah. it is it's it's kind of funny because like the if you think about it from a software perspective, like the actual interface of what a Bitcoin node does is is pretty simple. You know, it kind of like takes in these blocks and and maybe emits some transactions and acts as a relay for transactions. Like conceptually, the interface is, is pretty simple. And one of the first like Bitcoin related things that I did was kind of replicate the Bitcoin interface in, in Python in a project called uh, Tiny Chain, um, just kind of for my own education. Um, so it's a pretty simple thing, but uh, the defense mechanisms that Bitcoin has evolved over the years and like uh, sort of the optimizations that, that have been um, necessarily adopted make it like a toweringly complex piece of software. Um, and uh, like the, the, let me just interject here. Is it, do you think it's the social layer making it more complex or is it the technical interoperability it's, of it's, the code base as well? It's a, it's a combination of a lot of things. It, it's, it's, um, Unlike other software projects in that, you know, typically when you join a software project, one great way to learn the code base is to make a bunch of refactoring changes and make, make everything, um, you know, make a bunch of sort of, sort of cosmetic trivial changes um, that, that are, you know, good improvements, um, but they're not like totally critical. Um, in Bitcoin, that just doesn't happen because every single change is, is, needs to be extremely scrutinized and changing wide swaths of code for, um, reasons of you know style or cosmetics just isn't defensible and so as a result you know the the um changes that are made to bitcoin are extremely conservative and satoshi uh you know genius that he was uh you know probably didn't realize like the magnitude of what he was writing at the time and so you know i mean didn't structure the software in, in the best way so it's you know bit by bit we're kind of making um these uh, architectural improvements to Bitcoin, but there are still a lot of them to be made, and they're kind of hard to make because the the, the review process is so onerous. No, it was uh, I believe Francis Polat uh, shared the original source code of Bitcoin uh, on Twitter, I believe, uh, a few months ago, and he found it on Bitcoin Talk, a Bitcoin Talk thread from like 2013. But somebody had access and reviewed like the Bitcoin source code, uh, source code before the Genesis block was launched and shared it on bitcointalk.org and you go through and you see like Satoshi trying to describe everything and you could tell he was just like I think this will work I think this will work and it yeah. seems like we're uh we're uh we're sort of I mean uh, obviously it does work it's 10 years in production at this point but still making it as streamlined and and like you said re-architecting it uh is a big is a big task that we've been burdened with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a piece of software that's totally the product of like very adversarial evolution. It is a battle hardened piece of software. Like it's, it's, it is a big Bitcoin core is very reliable, but it's very ugly. You know, it's <laughs> like, it's like uh, a sort of like Frankenstein raised by wolves. Um, and I, <laughs> I have, Frankenstein raised by wolves. I, I love that. Yeah. I have, uh, a huge amount of respect for it um, because it, it humbles you, you know, when you, when you start to work on it um, because your like petty stylistic changes uh, just are not what it needs, you know? Um, so it's a, approaching it as a software engineer is, is a really interesting experience because it, it does tend to violate a lot of your, intuition about how software projects work have you ever been close to rage quitting 
Um, e, I, like micro rage quits. I've definitely micro rage quit on some PRs before. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually one one change that was just merged um, was adding uh, thread names to uh, Deadlock uh, debugging tools and um, logging. And when I initially proposed that, like I don't know, I spent like two three months in review, just kind of like addressing feedback and i was like you know what screw it i this this isn't essential like i've got other stuff to do but but i kept needing it for some of this benchmarking stuff and and some some uh, parallelism or uh, some um concurrency uh debugging stuff um so i i finally brought it back but it's yeah it's it i i guess the whole thing requires patience but it's kind of easy when you realize um how important it is that that the process be done right, you know? Yeah, we were uh, we met at the coffee shop earlier this morning. We were chit chatting about um, Rushinovsky and uh, his uh, his stoicness and and the refactor hell that he got stuck in for a couple of years, or is still stuck in, right? Russ is a personal hero of mine. I I love Russ. Like he he's just one of the best guys ever. I mean, talk about you know. Um, gems of bitcoin uh russ is one of them um this is this is a guy who um you know worked on google search he um implemented our values in c++ which is a huge deal um and yet he like (laughs) he he has no qualms he happily does grunt work a bunch of tedious like grindy near janitorial like maintenance of his of his pull requests um for years on end with with no light at the end of the tunnel and he just sits there and grinds and and he is like um uh, he, he's he's just a champion i i i uh, uh walking into work every day and getting to, to see a guy like russ is just like a delight so we've talked about it before on this podcast with Carl, Carl Dong when he was here a couple months ago, but I think it's uh, advantageous for us to sort of re-describe what Roy's doing, or not Roy, Russ is doing, um, and Russ is trying to basically separate the the wallet GUI from the node, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I was saying, you know, um, uh, Satoshi's design of the code uh, was extremely monolithic. It's like kind of a big ball of mud. Every Everything's kind of um, mixed together. Uh, and and we've made some pretty big strides even since then, like um, Blue Mat separating out main.cpp into validation, and that processing was a big step in the right direction. Russ is is doing a kind of um, fundamental change in that spirit, um, and he's trying to actually separate Bitcoin out into separate processes, so that you have sort of a consensus layer, um, you know, which is Bitcoin as we know it, and that runs in one process, and then you have things like the wallet. And the user interface running in separate processes. So if we get there, um, that's really going to be great for the project because not only will it allow the user interface and the wallet to to iterate faster than uh, the the consensus layer, but it'll it'll give us confidence that you know when we're changing something in one part of the code, it's not going to spill over and affect um, the really important stuff that the node's doing. Um, so that's critical work. And he's, he's, <laughs> I think he filed the first PR for that, like in late 2016 or early 2017. And he's just been carving off pieces of it and getting it merged since then. And he does so, you know, without ever complaining, um, and like reviewing everybody else's code, um, all the while. So, so Russ is really the guy that you want leading a change like that, um, uh, and he's really proven himself, I think, to the Bitcoin community, and um, and I, I couldn't be happier that uh, he's involved in the project and and uh, working on that in particular. The epitome of a servant leader, if you will. Russ is a philosopher king. Yeah, he's 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 great, man. Uh, uh, he's totally gonna hate that I'm blowing him up on this podcast, but uh, that's okay. Russ, come blow yourself up on this podcast. I want to hear from you. <laughs> Official invite sent. Over the airwaves. Um, and I'll reach out in person, of course. But uh, no, it's fascinating. What's it like working in that Shanko le- Labs? There's a, there's a bunch of personalities in there. There are a bunch of personalities in there. Uh, everybody's a personality there. Um, 
it's great. I love it. It it really um, it it's the only reason I tolerate New York City, um, <laughs> which I sort of love hate. Um, we all love hate the city. Yeah, it's very it's very uh, schizophrenic. Um, it was a really hard transition for me because um, before I worked on Bitcoin, um, I worked. Uh, for a time at uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, coming out of school, when I kind of thought I was uh, I was going to go into applied math or you know <clears throat> maybe academia. Ew, ew, yeah, <laughs> dude, go back and I can't and, imagine and you tell, as an academic. Tell like 2008, James. Ew, because I I mean I, I guess I didn't get too deep into it, but um, I I quickly found out that was not where I where I wanted to be. Um, and so I had this job at NIST working with some material scientists on um, a, 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 a partial differential equation solver package, which sounds really complex, but really it's just, it's, it's a lot of matrix algebra. So I was working on this thing and it was a, it was a great project. I really love the people that I work with. Um, John Geyer, the guy who runs uh, this thing, FiPi is, is a personal hero of mine. So that was really cool, but it, it was, it was a very researchy based environment. It was very free form and, um, it was kind of hard for me to just sort of work in a vacuum without, I, I really missed having like demands from customers because that provides a sort of clarity when you're working. You're like, oh, these people need this thing. Um, I'll do it. And then, you know, get a, a pat on the back or whatever, make some people happy. Um, when you're doing research, it's it's way less structured. Um, and so coming out of that, I was like, all right, I'm never, I'm never going to do a PhD. I'm never going to Gonna, gonna sort of be in a research position, um, but uh, little did I know that you know someday I'd end up at Chaincode, and and Chaincode's very researchy and it's very self directed, and um, for me that was that was a pretty jarring adjustment because I was kind of used to acting, um, oftentimes very tactically, and then and then maybe once in a while coming up with something very strategic to do. Um, so I had I had to adjust to that, and it was really uh, it was hard, especially when you're surrounded by incredibly brilliant people, you know. Um, uh, but uh, but it's awesome. I, I I mean I don't know. I really love Bitcoin, and um, and I really want the project to succeed. And so it's kind of easy to come up with stuff to do. Um, no, yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible what Alex and Suas are doing by just basically bankrolling all this too. So I guess on the subject of chain code and let's quote unquote dev incentives. Um, what do you think of the state of Bitcoin? If we need people like Alex and Suhas, uh, to sort of bankroll you guys to write code. That's a really hard question. Um, I, I guess though, I'm kind of, uh, encouraged by the fact that it seems, um, to be pretty finely dispersed across uh, a lot of, companies and patrons at this point um square crypto jumping into the fray yeah yeah square crypt crypto um you know places like fidelity hiring up a, a lot of good engineers almost every company that we talk to um uh during the bitcoin ops uh stuff uh w would say like yeah if if you know of a core developer just throw them over to us like we want to hire somebody um so I think there's a ton of interest and there's a ton of recognition in Bitcoin that without the open source, I, the open source component is everything. And Bitcoin doesn't exist without a robust community of you know serious engineers working on this stuff. So I think because that's that's really widely acknowledged, um, uh, I, I'm pretty hopeful. And I think, you know, if it wasn't an Al if, if it wasn't Alex and Suhas, I mean, I'm sure glad it, it's them. But um, if it wasn't them, you know, there 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 would be other people. Why are you glad it's them? I mean, I I don't want to gush too much on my uh, on my uh, um, you know my Bitcoin cohort on this podcast. I feel like this is me just dispense, especially you know when it's like when it's my bosses. But um, I really I love those guys. They're they they just have their heads on so straight, and um, it's really kind of rare that you find somebody in life, or at least it's rare for me. Um, where I find someone who's like kind of at, at the next stage of life, you know, these guys like um, they're, they have kids and stuff. And um, actually, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to dox them too hard, but the point is that I really, I really look up to them and, and they're just, 
Um, they're doing really, really cool things and they have done really cool things and uh, they're inspiring to work with because they, they're, they're a kind of intelligence that, um, that uh, uh, you know, a lot of the chain code guys are just the level of smart where it's almost, um, it's almost unbelievable. And I, I think I get by a lot on kind of hard work and persistence. And I mean, I'm, I'm a decently smart guy, but like, these guys are just a completely another. Don't another undersell level. yourself, James. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they're great. Um, I really like working for them because I, I I look up to them in a lot of ways. No, oh, yeah, it's for the pleasure of meeting Alex and having lunch uh, at Chain Code, I believe, last summer. It was an incredible experience getting to see his his fuck the man mentality. Uh, it was incredible to. That is our unofficial tagline. You know, we yeah. can't circulate it too widely. I want to make some shirts that sort of embed that somehow in a, in a mm-hmm. subtle way but yeah that's that's our tagline no but that's uh no it's a topic of conversation that comes up like blockstream build a borg chain code trying to hire these people to implement code to overtake bitcoin or whatever like there's those conspiracy theories out there where it's like come on people like and i think square crypto entering the fray like you were describing like fidelity asking for developers going around bitcoin optech other companies asking for developers i think Again, there's more companies joining the fray, and it, it took companies like Blockstream and Chaincode to sort of hold the torch and prove prove the way for for others to get comfortable with this type of model. Um, so, like, there's obviously there's skepticisms inherent in the Bitcoin community, and some people have skepticism towards these companies. It's like this is what you want, like, and I think I've been saying this a lot more recently. I think Bitcoin hitting a decade of production, ten years, is psychologically big for like the squares of the world, the incumbents of the world, to be like, all right. This is worth us investing in, in developers and stuff. So I'm happy that chain code exists to sort of prove the way. Totally, yeah. And I mean, as as the system represents more value, more and more people are going to want engineering stakeholders involved. You know, um, and so uh, is this pure? Is this pure <laughs> enough? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. So so people are going to want technical people to show up on their behalf, and it's going to happen, and the money's going to come in. And I mean, the, this thing, this thing. Yeah, will be um, uh, irrevocably kind of decentralized. Yeah. I hate that word, but you know. no. But it's a, every PR, no matter if it's coming from Chain Code or Blockstream or Square Crypto, has to go through a review process. It's not like yeah, they just get to push shit through. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. But to so to, so to bring it back to assume UTXO for <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, and talking about kind of centralization, um, a little bit, a little bit. Uh, I think one of the really cool use cases for Assume UTXO is for a sort of point of sale commercial type thing Mm -hmm. where, um, so one road that we're kind of going down here is the sort of CASA or BTC pay server fast sync approach where basically somebody is just like preloading a node with their data dir. Yeah, I forgot to I forgot to bring that up earlier. That's what Nicholas Durier hopped in the comments of your email chain, uh, highlighting BTC Pay Service solution. Yeah, yeah, and I, I I think that's a really dangerous road to go down. Why is this? Well, if you buy your Casa node, or you buy your you know, or you download your your BTC Pay Server instance, and you accept from them a a data directory and code that you're taking for granted, you're you're placing Tr- complete trust in them and we don't want that right um obviously you have to trust the bitcoin core repository because like that's the code that you're running but you really want to try and avoid trusting anybody else um and by trust bitcoin core i mean you know like you can verify the signatures or or uh, or the code or whatever but like as soon as you start to have these different points especially if they're if they're not public companies you know in the case of casa and you're just kind of taking a data dir from them and a Bitcoin D executable, like that's really dangerous. Why is it more dangerous the fact that they're not a public company? Oh, just if you can't see the code. You know, with, with BTC Pay server, you, you might be able to see the scripts that they're using to generate the data, or you might be able to um, kind of validate signatures on the on the data directory. But Oh, I thought you meant like publicly traded companies need to uh, need to share more data or something like that. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, Talk about like, open source projects yeah 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 just being able to look at the code and 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 you know verifying for yourself what's going on if you want to but so the the issue with the btc pay server fasting stuff is that 
basically it's like a zip file signed by Nicholas Dorier and co um, that you just kind of trust. And, and even to, to trust them, you then have to validate the signatures on that data, which users are notorious for not doing. I don't think, I don't think I've ever validated a signature. It's honestly hard. Like <laughs> it's, it's every time I have to do it, I'm like, Oh God, cause you got to import the GPG key and then you might have to like manually adjust the trust. I mean, it's, it's laughably, hard to do i don't i don't know why it has to be that i mean i don't know but but the point is that that we we really want to avoid a situation like that so we we want to build something in to bitcoin that that is safe um and i think assume utxo can do that and so i think it it, it becomes a really compelling option going forward do you think Companies like BTC Pay Server and Casa would be op- more open to this than the solutions that they've had to create. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely, because it's easier for them. I mean, they don't have to then maintain some hacky script that goes through and sanitizes a data dir and you know make sure if if it's just configuration options they pass into Bitcoin. That's a heck of a lot easier um, on their end for sure. I can imagine a lot less stress as well. But yeah, you can imagine like a small business owner saying, "Okay, I, you know, I want to accept Bitcoin payments, or oh, I got to set up my Bitcoin node." So you know, they buy a piece of hardware, and you know, it does the UTXO snapshot initialization, and then over the course of the next week or whatever, they do a full validation. Right? They can then fully validate that they 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 have a block, and and then you you know you have um, another full node on the network that's serving historical blocks, and um, I think that could be a really good thing. Do you think? People who IDB with assume UTXO become targets mm, for the um, period between validation. Uh, again, it's that's contingent. I mean, it's a good question because you know we gotta think adversarially about the stuff, but it's it's really contingent on getting the user to accept a bad assume UTXO value, mm-hmm. which which you just can't do unless you recompile Bitcoin. You know, like you, you apply someone else's change to your Bitcoin source code, then you recompile, then you run that. Like that's, you know, as soon as someone's asking you to change source code, like that should be a big, uh, big red flag because they could be asking you to do anything. So I don't see any reason why assume UTXO users would be targeted, you know, any more than anybody else. I'm just trying to think of how you could like prove that how hard this is. Could you prove how hard this is by like trying to attack it? Um, I, I, I think in many ways it's like trying to attack Assume Valid right now. In fact, mm-hmm. Assume Valid is potentially easier to attack because it, there's that command line flag there where you can say, oh, just start up your Bitcoin D node with like, you know, these these flags and you sneak an uh, Assume Valid value in there. Um, but then even then, you know, you need to basically sibyl the node so that it doesn't retrieve the most work headers chain from the network and then feed it a chain of blocks that includes the checkpoints and your bad block, um, which, you know, requires a lot of work. So, um, yeah, it's really, there's really not uh, an attack. When I started this, I mean, I I almost started this as an investigation. Um, It was half an excuse for me to make a really substantial change to Bitcoin because that's really the only way I learned the innards of something. I, I I think some people can just, like, stare at, a, a, a piece of software for a long time and understand it. I have to make changes. And so um, I started this as a way to do that as well as a way to investigate this idea that other people had, you know, other, other sort of gray beards in the project had, had uh, talked favorably about checking out. And so gray beards, um, <laughs> the gray beards of Bitcoin, they're real, man. Um, <laughs> that's I, uh, again, like I don't want to, I don't need to shill Bitcoin to um, or sh- shill Bitcoin development culture to listeners of Tales from the Crypt. I'm sure, but maybe it helps to hear that um, I, I've had a few jobs in the software industry and and a few jobs at some some places I'm really proud to have worked at, um, but nowhere else do you find guys like Greg Maxwell who are in their you know who who have decades of experience doing this stuff. Um, with just a sort of intrinsic um, uh, aptitude for designing security critical systems, I've never I've never encountered a group of engineers more capable and competent in my life. Um, and it's it, that's that's I mean that's a lot of what drew me to Bitcoin initially is I saw the quality of people working on it and I was just like, 
this is completely unparalleled um, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, that's what makes me, again, going back to skepticism, very skeptical of, of any uh, Bitcoin usurper coming out of the blue and uh, and thinking as adversarially as, as the Bitcoin core team has up to this point and, and sort of replicating the... the uh, carefulness with which the project is approached totally uh, you know um i know that bitcoin allegedly has like the seven magic network effects or whatever that trace Mayer talks about which i you know i like i like hearing but you know i don't know anything about markets i don't know anything about oh we're gonna get into your market thoughts in a second here you, you <laughs> god know, you know i, I hope things. for the listeners sake that we don't but uh, <laughs> um i you know but i do know about software engineering and and that is really the network effect in bitcoin that i that I watch and um, it would be evident to me if, if there were um, if there was another project that came along that really had some kind of critical mass that, that, that concern, you know, kind of made me think, okay, well there's a real kind of challenger here, but there, there really in my mind just, just is not. What's uh what's the repository looking like these days? How many people are joining in the, uh, the review? Um, is there a lot more contributors? I saw the contributor list that went out with the version zero point eighteen release. It seemed like there was more than a hundred names on it. Yeah, it's 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 sizable. I think there are some really promising new people coming on board. Um, there's a, there's a French guy named Antoine Riaud who uh, had been contributing to um, Bitcoin Rust for a while, and he's kind of getting into the mix. Um, but again, I mean, there's always a scarcity of really really qualified people who can do very effective review the most the most that we can hope for at this point is that we're starting to seed those kind of people um and so like i'm i'm kind of on my journey you know getting getting to that to that place um with certain parts of the code um but uh i i think you know there's there's increasing interest um there are even more people coming along you do you do find people who come along and um start you know everybody starts with sort of maybe superficial observations or changes or reviews to bitcoin and that's okay you just got you got to get familiar somehow um so i think we've definitely seen an uptick in that regard but um gray beards are slow to emerge (laughs) and uh, i think it would be remiss of us if we did not mention the fact that uh, john noberry for the next couple weeks is running a, a pr review club i believe wednesdays for the next few weeks oh yeah an irc that's right yes Um, yeah, you freaks out there who want to get involved in the review process, go check that out. Um, I kind of hope he starts to do like a, a video call style thing. Cause I just intuitively to me, that seems a little bit more high bandwidth than, than doing IRC, yeah. but it seems like it's turned into like the Ethereum calls, which, which are, I guess that's a good point. Yeah. They, they never seem like organized to me, but review is review is just very nuanced and very hard. And I, I imagine he's going to be doing a lot of typing. So yeah, good that's on what John. I was going to say. How do you do like a review club in IRC? Like typing all that out—that sounds terrible. It's yeah. It's <laughs> I, I think it's going to be terrible. It's it's a significant <laughs> significant act of charity on John's part. So I, I I hope it's successful. But damn, man, I would I would fire up a you know, maybe get, like an audio stream or something. You need to get Brian Bishop up here or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get cyborg conjure to do the transcription uh, you know he uh, another thing about him he's really into ge- um genetics and gene hacking and stuff uh he's, he's an interesting follow check check out conjure if you, if you don't already no i really uh, yeah cause he's actually got uh, talks from before bitcoin talking about gene stuff genetic stuff correct I yeah he really knows his stuff I, yeah. I worked in biotechnology briefly uh for uh about two years in um uh doing doing gene um gene diagnostics basically at a lab in uh, california and so I, I have like a little bit of I, I have enough background to know that he seems to know what he's talking about yeah man, a, a well-rounded renaissance man brian bishop truly it's, truly um speaking of renaissance what's going on in the world right now are we are we in the midst of a renaissance are we in the midst of a of the world crumbling around us this is something that james and i when we meet up outside the podcast we talk a lot about is macro themes geopolitics what the hell is going on in the world What's going on with the central banks? How much money is being printed? Will it ever stop? Uh, we had an update to that conver- ongoing conversation this morning at the coffee shop, and I think uh, I think your perspective is interesting. I think it's a good one to put out there for the freaks too. Like what you're worried about, what you're looking at, your theories, the binariness of Bitcoin's potential. Um, so let's jump into that. Yeah, um, 
binariness a word? Yeah, it should be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it it can be for us. <laughs> um, Binary nature. Yeah, I, I I'm kind of a perma bear. I think I've always been a perma bear. I I remember in in high school coming home, um, really drunk and sitting down at the kitchen table with my dad, and I and I started weeping. I think about the fall of capitalism or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> As we all have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so it's hard for me sometimes to, to disentangle my own, um, maybe, uh, bias, uh economically bias. pessimistic bias nature. Yeah. It, it's weird. I, I kind of fight with myself a lot because I, in many ways I'm a very optimistic person and I'm, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about, you know, the, the possibilities of life and so forth. But, uh, I've really, <laughs> I've really been pretty bearish on, um, on things for a few years here. Um, but recently I think, um, I've grown even more bearish and, and I've, I've grown alarmed. Um, oh God, I mean, there's, there's a, I guess no, no shortage of, a, uh, of alarm on the internet. Um, and I'm now adding to it because, um, uh, ever since, um, the, the fed, um, basically reversed their sort of hawkish approach, um, beginning of this year beginning of this year went from two hikes this year to zero to zero yeah it's and almost implied you know rate cuts uh at some point um or or additional you know um uh quantitative easing measures but a- anyway i guess like before we get into this uh i'm just if, if bitcoin didn't exist i don't know if i'd be able to get up in the morning you know it's like <laughs> Think things I are hear that a lot, man. Why? Why do you think that is? Is is Bitcoin that much? Like, are we crazy to think that Bitcoin is can solve some of these problems? I think it certainly can. I think it's an open question of whether it will. Um, actually, I'm not in question about that. I think it it will. It's just kind of a matter of on what time scale. You know, it might take. I don't know, it could take a hundred years or, or more. I, I I think that people who benefit from the system as it exists now, namely people who are well connected to the banking system, um, people in, in entrenched in various parts of government, uh, definitely have an interest in keeping this, this party rolling for as long as they possibly can. Um, but I, I think that there is a certain gravity to a sound money system. And, um, this, this, this really wasn't something that I had thought a ton about before, um, getting into Bitcoin. But, um, (laughs) I, it kind of blows my mind that, that we've really only been, um, in a fiat money experiment, you know, since the seventies. Um, and, and most people don't realize that I didn't realize that for sure. Um, generation and a half. Yeah. And, you know, in that span of time, we've seen some insane uh, uh, economic uh, exuberance um, and subsequent bust. And, and I don't think that we've seen, I don't think that we've really, that, that all the chickens have yet come home to roost. Um, Certainly not. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think the fiat money experiment is, um, is is really wild. Just basically the idea that the government has um, the discretion to just kind of expand the money supply and, and, and as a result of doing so, devalue the savings of anyone who has bothered, you know, to have a low time preference and set aside some savings. Um, I, I think that's criminal, but it's not well understood by most people, which is is really kind of the, the fundamentally scary thing to me is is that there's a total divergence between... There's a collective ignorance. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, I mean, it, it kind of mirrors the wealth inequality in the sense that there are a few people who, who know what's going on, you know, who are kind of tuned into what the function of the Fed is and indeed, like, what even the M2 or, you know, or M1 money supply, like, means and represents and how that affects um, businesses and savings and, and, and people's lives. And then there's, you know, so that's maybe like, I don't know, say 5% of the population, if that. And then there's the other 95% who are just kind of like subject to all this and going along and not really thinking about it. Um, and, and they're drastically affected by this stuff. Um, and, you know, all you have to do is look at some statistics, uh, suicide attempts, opiate addiction, 
uh, bankruptcy. Like the, things are. I mean, we've been saying this for a while. Like you said, our permable, permable. Excuse me, perma, perma bear. I have very similar uh, thoughts as well, and have had very similar thoughts for for the better part of a decade now, almost. Um, but you're. But like when I wrote about in the bent last week, I think you actually responded, and we had like a little email conversation about it. Is like this debt fueled society basically sows the seeds of its own destruction over time. Because again, we, we I tied that to like birth rate, like birth rate ac- across the world's going down. Like kids aren't having kids anymore. You're seeing the Japanification Japanification of the world play out in real time. And what this does, we can tie this into a bunch of things, and we will. But the one thing that I talked about in the bent in particular is like. Again, the the debt fueled society sows the seeds of its own destruction because it forces people to to basically weigh opportunity costs, and it's gotten to a point where the opportunity cost is breeding and having kids because people are going into so much debt, and they can't buy houses, they have to pay back their their student loans, so they're forced to choose like, can I even afford to have a kid right now? A lot of people are saying, no, I can't. We used to have a society before we went off the gold standard where you could have one. A single single parent provide for the whole family. Now you you have most of America where both parents have been forced into workplace many times in two or three jobs, and uh, not even many parents, many people, like many many singles, many individuals, and it's literally becoming to a point where this this debt fueled system, which relies on more people pumping more consumption and more money into it, is sort of destroying itself because it's not allowing itself to create a base to sort of keep that going at a certain point. So maybe that's when the ultimate uh, doom that we've been feeling inherently for the last decade comes to be, comes to fruition is when that generational shift happens and you literally don't have somebody to foot the bill. Yeah, you absolutely tied together uh, a bunch of different elements there that that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, I really gotta go to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. Bathroom break. One. Edit out the, uh, yeah, one ten twenty five. I think exactly in the, in the way that you're saying there's this short termism induced by um, the the behavior of the Fed in terms of expanding the monetary base. Um, people focus on consumption because why wouldn't you if your value is quickly eroding? And as a result of the increasing price of the really important stuff that we all need to live, like real estate, for example, or healthcare, education, education, you know. Everybody has to work all the time, and we have to work at these jobs that that <laughs> kind of indicate like malinvestment. I mean, look at Uber and Lyft's financials. Just go to any WeWork and walk around. Right. Well, check out what people are working on. Like, sorry, is, if you're in a WeWork right now, I'm sorry. But <laughs> there's a lot of yeah. It's not you. There's it's a ton of malinvestment we going on out there. Right. I mean, we should we should be thinking about how to build more affordable housing and not like uh, I don't know how to how to create yet another like e-commerce fashion platform. Not that there's anything per se wrong with that, but I, I just think there's a lot of frothy um, stuff going on. But um, so so yeah, I, I I think it creates a sort of short termism, and that debases people's sense of purpose really because you just kind of lapse into this like hedonism where you're, you're all about like food or trying the newest restaurant cloud chasing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and so I think like when I say the reason I get up in the morning is, is Bitcoin, it's, it's, it's because, um, well, primarily I see Bitcoin as an antidote to this, but at a kind of like Straussian level, um, Bitcoin is something that has long-term value and purpose, you know, and it's, it's, it's kind of the antithesis of, uh, Oh, I'm just waiting until the next like uh, delicious meal at the latest trendy restaurant. You know, um, Peter, I watched uh, recently this week, Jeremy Welch, breakfast with him recently. He recommended this Peter Thiel video. He went to some college with Cornell West and basically had a Q&A with the students and touched on what you just did. Like we're turning into like a economy built on like new e-commerce platforms and new websites, basically. It's like built on basically just creating visual and UX flows. It's nothing like nothing crazy is being produced. We're not going to Mars. We're not mining asteroids. Shit yeah. Like that. A lot of it's and, window dressing. Yeah, exactly. It's all window dressing and it's scary. It's scary. Like what are, are we stuck in this sort of state of treading water and mediocrity and, and just trying to, again, it's what we would, I would, what I would argue is that we're stuck in this, the system that's forced 
us to create these shitty jobs. And I think that's what we're getting into in this, this part of discussion right now. But like, how do we get out of it? Like that's, that's how do you unwind this, this malinvestment to unwind it? I I think you have to have a renewed list of priorities about what's worth focusing on as an individual. Um, and, um, I, I've actually been listening to a lot of Jordan Peterson lately, uh, who, who's, I, I think, a wonderful thinker. Um, and he's particularly fascinating because before I actually started listening to him, I had always heard these kind of like shadowy, nefarious, like like that he had some reputation. I was like, oh, okay, this guy's like a secret racist or he's, you know, some, he's like in the alt right or something like that. And then I actually started listening to him and I was like, this guy just makes a ton of sense and he has no, you know. I wake up and make my bed every morning. Yeah. Well, you've you've set your house in order, Marty. Um, Marty has a beautiful apartment, by the way. Um, Thank you, James. But um, I, I really like his take on basically load yourself up with as much responsibility as you possibly can, because pursuing happiness in life um, is is not a good aim. He argues, and I mean, there's a semantic game you can play there, where you know, depending on how you define happiness, maybe it is a worthwhile end. But I th- I think the point is is to basically put responsibility on yourself and start thinking about things that are very long term to, to get back to like the macro end of of our discussion um my prediction is that central banks um will continue with quantitative easing they'll continue buying assets they'll continue their open market operations they'll continue expanding the money supply in effect um because as soon as they stop that then the level of corporate debt, the amount that that businesses in, in America and around the world are leveraged, is just going to explode. Um, if it's not first the entitlement programs that are already you know predicted to be insolvent and contingent on pop population growth that we just don't have anymore because because people aren't having kids because we're not thinking about the long term, you know. All right, we need to get back to the seven generations mentality of the Iroquois nation. Um, it's, but ha- like, again, you said we're, we're stuck again, and this is the big theme on this podcast that we're stuck in this inflection point, this anomaly of history that like, and like we've been touching on, like nobody really realizes that you're just born into the system. You start running, you start going you're like, Oh, this is just the way it fucking works. And then, so how do we get people to question that? So that's the most important thing. I think we have to get people to is just a point to even fucking question the system they're living in. Yeah. I, th- I think it's going to become increasingly evident. You know, if you think back to say the, the forties and fifties, I mean, those were not ideal times for a variety of reasons, but you could get a house guys our age, like would have a house and there wasn't really a question about that. You lived next to a variety of people. Like, you know, if you're a garbage man or a janitor, like you could have a house, you could probably live in the same neighborhood that I could. There was, there was a lot more equality, but because we've now segmented the population into those with financial assets and those who benefit from, you know, inflationary um, monetary expansion and those who do not. Now it's, it's v- increasingly rare that these things that we once were able to afford as a, as a civilization, we can't. And so it's, I think that'll b- continue to become more pronounced and cause people to ask, how did this happen? Like, how do we get here? What's going on? Yeah. The and this down. Is, oh, okay. Go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say the downside, and this is a whole nother sort of, Um, segment of the conversation is that I don't think people are going to realize why or how we got into the the, the position that we're in and until it's too late huh until it's too late until it's too late yeah because the the political expedience of something like modern monetary theory yeah I I saw that look on your face and I mean that's exactly how I feel Dalio just came out said it's inevitable it and it is it is cynically modern, modern monetary theory is inevitable because the the political pally, uh, palatability of it is so high. For politicians, it's fantastic because they no longer have to raise taxes to be able to breadwin for their constituents. And people who don't pay very much attention to politics love it, be, or uh, don't pay very much attention to economics love it because basically, you know, that's free stuff for everybody, and there's a sort of overwhelming socialist rhetoric now because, you know, capitalism has failed. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. We have not lived in a truly capitalistic system uh, in a while. 
Oh yeah, for sure. There's yeah. definitely capitalistic aspects of capitalism in America, no doubt. I mean, entrepreneurship's heavy and stuff like that. But the bailout of the banks proved bar none. Like if you have you, it's basically a two trillion dollars socialist pr- program. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's ironic because. Uh, We've, we've only government intervention has only in, increased, you know, in the 20th century and, and 21st century. And that's that's when capitalism starts to fail is when it becomes crony capitalism. And then all of a sudden you're awarding 400 billion billion dollars to completely dysfunctional banks because they made a huge mistake. Um, and uh, but but yeah, I mean, like going back to even like FDR's introduction of Social Security, um, you know, uh uh, Nixon's uh, me- Medicare changes. I mean, like uh, all this, all this stuff is is an increased element of socialism that is is creating huge dysfunction, and and people are just like calling for more of it, calling for more of it, and at a time like again going back to stats, like look at the state of our society. We'll talk about America in particular since we are Americans. This is where we live, but uh, like it's been an apparent like the opioid crisis is turning into an epidemic, especially here in the Northeast in certain parts of the country. Uh, depression at an all-time high, suicide r- suicide rates at an all-time high, and the youth it's it's rising as well. If you look at the younger ages, the effect that social media is having on them and the, the clout chasing sort of uh, environment that they've been brought up in is is leading them astray, and it's being proven in the stats of mental health. Because so mental health wise, we're we're going in the wrong direction in this country, and I think it, it, tying it all back together to the the separation of the haves and have nots that this monetary policy is is basically set into play and like you said like the people with financial assets with paper wealth are allowed to inflate that paper wealth via the money printing uh the, the people who do not have access to those types of investments are are getting left behind and getting their purchasing power destroyed via inflation slowly but surely over time and again it's you're starting and, and then at the same time you have the goddamn fucking government in this country is so ass backwards the framing of the conversation at the political level doesn't even make sense in my opinion it's all just a bunch of shouting against each other or excuse me past each other and we're getting to a point where like politics is so polarized that people are starting to physically lash out like if you wear a MAGA hat walking around it's a good chance in some places you'll get punched in the face somebody will take your hat and like the the rhetoric around global warming now too like you could see definitely there's about to be like social justice warriors coming at you if you don't agree with with all their their views on climate and stuff it seems like there's tensions building up between different sects uh of the uh of the underprivileged in this in this two-tiered society that again it feels like the fabric of our the continuity of our societies slowly somebody's somebody's pulling the thread of the sweater yep yep and I think the possibility of meaningful reform in the existing political infrastructure that we have here, to me, is just kind of out of the question. I, I think that ship has sailed, on, really unfortunately. And I, I, I don't say that with, with, um, well, with uh, lightly. No, this is something like, again, going back to the mechanics of our government. Like, why do we have 100 senators, 535 representatives, nine judges, and a president? Like, the way it's set up, like the mechanics of our government was set up in a time where people had to fucking ride horses to get to the, the fucking state building to speak on behalf of their constituencies. We live in a time and an era where we do not need these politicians. They basically represent our voice. We allocate our voice to them to speak on our behalf. I'm not calling for direct democracy or anything, but there is a way they are, uh, they are a very constricting. It's a very constricting system at this point considering the technology and the, the, the open communication channels that we have as a society. Yeah, I, it, you know, the, the fix is not so clear to me. Um, it's not clear to me either. There's a really great book um, called Amusing Ourselves to Death, which is a very short book. It's maybe 100 pages, and it's about the way that television as a medium affected politics. And um, what the author talks about is, is back, you know, in the early days of this country, the political process, um, as you can imagine, was very low-tech. And if you were a politician, you would get up and make a two, three hour long speech that had been memorized in front of a group of people. And then you would take questions. And if you wanted to participate in political discourse, you, you know, you had to write, you had to read, um, you had to go out and listen, you talk to people face to face. Whereas when television came around, um, 
education and political participation got mixed in with entertainment. And all of a sudden, you know, you could sort of feel like you were being informed or you could feel like you were participating when really you were consuming something that was crafted. Blue versus red. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Blue man yelling at red man. And, and you know, it's it's a sort of another case of uh, a vested interest manipulating people who don't have time or interest to really figure economics and politics out. And so uh, democracy doesn't work, and I know you weren't advocating for, for democracy because, you know— it, in in a short summary, it's it's uh, two wolves and a lamb voting on what's for dinner, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what I what I love about Bitcoin is that it's a sort of modular advancement to it's it's removing a function of government that could be manipulated and indeed is being manipulated in a very big way by nineteen people um, on the FOMC, um, nineteen or seventeen, whatever the number is. I think it's 12 voting governors and then you have like six on and the bench or something the like that. the seven, yeah, the seven yeah. Um, at the federal level. Um, so you have 19 people controlling the money supply, you know, and allegedly they're not they're not political because they're not elected. They're not, you know, they, they don't have explicit party affiliations or whatever. But we all know that's that's garbage. These are human beings. This is a human system. We've all seen The Wire. We know what happens. <laughs> we know how this goes. We know how this movie ends. Like... They get they get they get politically invested somehow because they're human beings and they have interests, um, and so money like again you know most people don't realize this it it affects everything else it is upstream of everything else it, that's why like and there's been tr- tropes throughout history like money is the core of all evil money is the root of all evil like money drives everything money makes the world go around like stack money fuck bitches get money like <laughs> like it, it, there's it feels like there's been like warnings throughout history, like pay attention to the money, pay attention to the money. Like, yes. Please pay attention to the money. That's what makes the world go around. And we have completely not been paying attention to the money yes. for a few decades now. Because it's, it's the crystallization of people's time and time obviously is the scarcest resource. And so as soon as, as soon as you affect money, it's hard to tell, you know, uh, what isn't affected. So my point being that, that Bitcoin in particular takes money out of the control of of any given human being and i i think that the effects of that and the benefit of that cannot be understated but um i don't know how long it's going to take man it 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 could be a really long time because there um is a huge i i doubt that um everybody's just going to sort of make this smooth migration to decide you know that oh yeah like uh, this this computer program that supplies our money is good and furthermore we want to completely upset the existing power structures and um uh, uproot the yeah. system we were born into yeah yeah i i think what's way more likely is that something like mmt is going to come to the fore and that the printing presses are going to heat up and they aren't going to stop i'm just waiting for my yang gang uh freedom <laughs> div- dividend but that's like yeah, I, I completely agree. I think QE, Infinity is going to keep going. Modern, modern, I mean, it's going to go until it can't anymore. And that's, uh, I mean, and like you said, like we can't force people to question this stuff. It's it's like what Matt and I say on Rabbit Hole Recap, like you want Bitcoin before you need it. Um, people aren't going to realize they yeah. need it until it's too late. Uh, yeah, totally. For, totally. for a large chunk of people. Um, what, what was I about to go into? Uh, what did I mention before that? Well, I, okay. So one of the things that, that, um, you had mentioned earlier was my sort of like binary valuation yes, thesis. That's what I want to go into about Bitcoin. Um, which I think is kind of a, it's kind of encouraging. For and I have a follow up question. As okay, well. cool, cool, cool. So I, I've been thinking a little bit recently that basically in the mid to long term, Bitcoin has a binary outcome. It's either a success and people use it, or it's a complete failure for some reason that we discover later on. Um, which I don't think will amount to like, like it becoming illegal or something. I think that's kind of a short run, um, condition, but, um, so I'm, I'm thinking that, yeah, basically Bitcoin's either worth an incredible amount or it's worth nothing. And so as a result, like the sort of expected value for you right now, I, you, you only have to own a little, a little bit of Bitcoin. Like, a, you know, if, if you own a little bit, then, um, you stand to gain a huge amount if it appreciates, 
and you stand to lose not not that much um, right now. So I guess this is like when people refer to Bitcoin as being a call option on like a future system of value. That that makes a lot of sense to me intuitively. And so I guess a lot of the reason I've been paying attention to macroeconomics is like, well, maybe I should rebalance a little bit and and you know figure out like what's another place to put my money. But <laughs> in the course of doing that, it's it's become apparent to me just how grim you know kind of any other means of value store is right and so speaking of bitcoin specifically and your medium to long-term view like what needs to happen like at the protocol and infrastructure level for it to be ready for this like because that's like what i wrote about in the bend today like 2017 during the euphoria during the run-up uh december of that year like the exchange infrastructure wasn't ready fees went through the roof which isn't necessarily a bad thing um segwit wasn't adopted yet like where are we from like a inf- protocol level efficiency standpoint and like an overall infrastructure standpoint to to making this possible for not even mass adoption but adoption at a material level the faster that bitcoin ossifies the better in my mind mm-hmm. we could freeze it today and it wouldn't be ideal but it would be workable um I think the malleability fix, you know, even if SegWit had made it in, I mean, it would be a total pain to do lightning, but you could do it. You could work it out. There are second layer schemes, um, you know, that, that can compensate for that. So my, my position is one of kind of extreme conservatism. Um, I want to make Bitcoin as resilient as possible, as quickly as possible, so that we can basically just solidify it um, and cement it. Um, because my real concern would be a sort of populist perversion of Bitcoin where we're making changes and we keep making changes at a pretty rapid clip and all of a sudden uh, there's kind of popular sentiment for some kind of, you know, inflation schedule that's different than the one that we have now. Um, ew. Yeah, ew. Ew. Freaks, if that ever gets proposed, um, get your pitchforks out. Or just be right, or not your pitchforks. Just get ready to fork and not not implement that code. <laughs> your figurative pitchfork. Um, um, no, I agree completely. And so, you you think okay, it's not perfect right now, but it'd be workable. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. If 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 you if you cemented Bitcoin, um, I mean, I think um, in terms of the consensus layer, yes. Uh, obviously, there. You know, we're gonna keep needing to make peer to peer upgrades. Um, uh, just in terms of making sure that everything's resilient, um, but I, I think, generally speaking, with consensus, it's it's workable right now. That being said, um, the improvements that are slated um, for uh, proposal, I think Peter just just uh, dropped his uh, his his soft work proposal um, recently yesterday. Ooh, I don't know if you saw that. I it's, did not it's, see it's that. Floating Finally around. dropped. It's floating around, and uh, it's pretty exciting. Um, graft root, which is basically a technique for making um, any one sort of Bitcoin script type resemble any other, um, is is really nice. That's a really great improvement. Schnorr, obviously, for its aggregation potential and simplicity, huge improvement. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Did I say... Graft root, I mean tap root. Tap root yeah. yeah, so so graft root then is really exciting because it sort of allows you to dynamically append spend conditions to a coin, which would allow you to sort of you know amend S- smart contract. I suppose. Yeah, it's 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 smart contracty, mm-hmm. um, but it's a good protocol. And again, it still just resembles like a, a small Bitcoin transaction in the way that that tap root does. So those things are really really exciting and they're really cool and I and I think you know, there's a good chance that that we'll have them Um, and they're great, but they're not necessary. Um, What is necessary is that the the properties that Bitcoin exhibits right now stay intact. Um, And and I think there's a really good chance that that will be the case. But I think, you know, there's an interesting debate about like the privacy technology on chain. Um, I'm kind of skeptical of that because I think that Bitcoin's auditability is 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 more critical than on-chain privacy and i think that there are second layer approaches to doing privacy i agree and don't tell eric boskill that i would oh god yeah <laughs> <laughs> don't want to get that B- that guy mad don't want to meet that kind of back alley bitcoin's not audible auditable <laughs> <laughs> seriously that's what he's saying uh i don't want to speak for him okay. on his behalf. Right. um 
and I'm too stupid to to present his idea with. I know, I know, he's got some very uh, nuanced uh, and I think aggressively he has, presented he has, ideas. Uh, he has some thoughts on Nick Carter's proof of solvency theory that you can force exchanges to sort of prove that they're solvent to a certain extent. Okay, all right, okay. Well, Nick Carter's another gem. Another gem. Another gem uh, Bitcoin. Another past TFTC TC guest. Here. I wonder if he's a beefy Bitcoin boy. He's not a beefy Bitcoin boy. No, there's very few of us. How do we induct beefy Bitcoin? I don't boys? know. I think we have to. I think we have to uh, Greco Roman wrestle. Bear How chest. much do you have to be able to squat to become a beefy? Uh, I'm not a big squatter. I'm, um, more free weight guy. Okay, well, that's that, okay, that's fine. I don't that's know. That's fine. I, it's deadlift. We're a deadlifting community. Okay, all right. You okay. gotta be able to deadlift okay, yep. uh, at least your body weight, one and a half times your body weight. There say. we go. Yeah, I like that. That's that seems that's like a good a, metric. I, yep. I'm pretty sure I can do that right now. I'm sure you can do that. Yeah, you're a strong guy, Marty. Um. Yeah, you're looking. You're looking extra beefy these days, <laughs> in a good way, not in a doughy way. Thanks, man. Lean, it's, lean beef. It's been a rough few weeks with the moving, but I'm. I'm I want to get back into the the CrossFit classes as soon as I can. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to loop back to that uh, we were talking about at coffee that I wanted to bring up in our macro chat is like we were talking about the monetary policies affecting the inequality and stuff like that. But then like, and the social programs are affecting stuff like that. And then we talked about minimum wage too. And I, this is another important factor that I think is, is another important variable that I think is factoring into the sort of degradate, degradate, degradation of our society to a certain extent is like, and I, this thought came to be after watching a Thomas soul, uh, conversation that was published in December by, uh, I believe the Hoover Institute or the Hoover University or something like that. And he basically explained how like, and it makes sense, like minimum wage, all it does is, is the most important demographic that it affects probably is teenagers looking to get their first jobs and develop yeah. work ethic. And if you take away the ability for teenagers to develop a work ethic, they're not going to develop a work ethic and, or they're going to have a harder time doing it later in life. The, the argument I'm trying to make is like, I started working when I was 12 and I think that work ethic of starting then and being able to have jobs that were paying cash under the table and stuff like that was really formative to who I have become as a person and learn, learning hard lessons as a teenager because I was able to be paid under, under the table was, was huge. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and just even, you know, it, it's amazing. Like, um, even having the possibility to to go out and get a job as a young or unexperienced or or you know someone who's been marginalized by society, um, that that process of being able to bootstrap yourself into the labor market to accumulate experience you know on the job, um, is is so incredibly important and it's the epitomization of one of these policies where it's sort of naively touted by people who you know probably genuinely want to do the right thing and help people. But it ends up hurting the most marginalized people and, and reinforcing a sort of like um, virtualization or intellectualization of our of our world and our economy. I mean, you need to go out and work a shitty job as a as a as a child. Like it's a formative experience. You learn how to deal with the crazy general public, how to deal with like, uh, you know, a, a maybe sometimes oppressive managerial structures like like you you learn how to adapt to all these conditions and and furthermore you have all these wonderful experiences that you just you wouldn't otherwise if you just jumped right into a white collar kind of kind of workforce if you're fortunate enough to be able to do so yeah and then um, again the opportunity cost if you're not able to get a job what are you going to be doing you're going to be hanging out doing bad you'd be shit. selling drugs maybe yeah, yeah yeah i mean if if all right so if you're a kid in the inner city in a shitty part of town um you're already getting screwed by your education system because it's doing nothing for you. You're probably screwed. You know, let's let's assume nutritionally, you're in a food desert most likely. Yeah, you're in a food desert. Like there might be racism affecting you. You know, basically the odds are stacked against you, and your only hope is, in some cases, going out and getting a job and like bootstrapping yourself into society. Um, and often, like the the best way to do that is a is a low wage job. And I mean, there's some great statistics out there about the fact that people often readily advance beyond the minimum wage. Uh, there are very few people who actually sit at the minimum wage. And um, I'd refer people to a recent episode of uh, uh, Russ Roberts' excellent podcast called Econ Talk, where he talks to a guy in um, at the University of Washington who did a very comprehensive study on minimum wage. And he found that basically 
you know, there are people who benefit from minimum wage, but they're really not people who need the benefit the most. The people who are hurt most by minimum wage are people who lack experience, who, you know, are teenagers, um, who are maybe, you know, systematically discriminated against. Because remember, if you're charging a minimum wage, that's an excuse for someone to indulge in their biases, not to hire you. So if you can outcompete somebody on price, that allows you to overcome bias in society. But if everybody's stuck at this floor of like, say, $15 an hour, then, you know, like the pretty blonde girl who applies to be a cashier is 10 out of 10 times going to get that job uh, before you do. Whereas if you can actually compete on price and negotiate, then you, you can get into a workplace and, and accumulate experience for yourself. So I, th- I think your point's a really good one that it just kind of epitomizes um, this increased sort of like uh, restriction on freedom that's, that's, that's leading people to live these sort of detached short-term lives where there aren't many prospects for accumulating wealth over the long term. Yeah. Again, like detached, we're a society detached from reality to a certain extent. Like we were talking about a call. Like, are we crazy? Like, are we the ones like, are we the crazy ones? <laughs> I Is everything okay? Yeah. Is everything okay? And we're just crazy. I, I, I mean, you know, if you look back, there were some crazy things going on in the 20th century. You know, I mean, uh, we were putting Japanese people in internment camps. There was incredible stagflation in the 70s, oil shortages, people waiting hours in line for gas. Inflation was crazy. I mean, some part of me thinks like, wow, we're doing a lot better than we were back then. Um, and at least now we have technology. But I, I, I am constantly amazed at the rate of change, especially in our lives. I mean, if you think about it, we're the last generation that was born really before the mass deployment of the internet, before we were sitting on computers all day. You know, you and I were probably like running outside in the woods as mm-hmm. kids for entertainment. I was in North Philly playing double Dutch or not playing double Dutch, double Dutching. Double Dutch? You, oh, man, you knew how to double Dutch? Yeah, yeah. Wow. There, was, uh, there were some girls on the block that liked to double Dutch. Nice. Uncle Marty would hop in every once in a while. You nice. Know? <laughs> that's a, Dude, that's a great image. <laughs> Marty doing, it's doing double Dutch. I don't know if I could do it today. It double took, Dutch, you really got to time your, your entrance. Yeah, that 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 struck me. I mean, I, I'd be scared for my, uh, for my physical well-being trying to do double Dutch. It took me a while to get rope skills, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, yeah, like. We are that bridge generation. Things are changing at a rapid pace, but I, th- I think we are succeeding in spite of the system, at least the political and monetary system that we find ourselves under. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And is it success? Like, is is this quote unquote proze- progress success? Is there such thing as uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Admirable uh, progress versus uh, sort of uh, frowned upon progress. Like, do we want? rappers rapping about lean and so people clout chasing about doing xanax and right fucking bitches and twerking and all that stuff right or, right, right or do we want uh sort of a society with mission driven society again going back to like seven generations like that's again we're not mission driven we're clout driven um yeah 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 and and i think one interesting thing that crosses my mind a lot you know again um worrying about being a being a sort of perma bear pessimist is is that sometimes I think that material success and wealth almost sows the seeds of its own downfall because in getting really comfortable and, you know, and having all these, these wonderful innovations of the 20th century, we've gotten really comfortable, especially, you know, being in America and having a reserve currency and all the privileges that come with that. Like maybe because things are so comfortable, we've, we've become soft and we've forgotten where prosperity actually comes from because it was already here when we showed up. Yeah. So this is like the hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men. Or something. Wow. Yeah. That, that hits the nail on the head. Yeah. And, and I really worry that we're in the later part of that cycle where, um, All right, here it is. Hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men and weak men create hard times. Yeah. It, so there's a really kind of poetic symmetry to that 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 rings true and it's really concerning because uh, it tells me that I don't think things are going to get better until they get a lot worse and we really undergo some kind of catastrophe, which I am not looking forward to. Um, well, this goes into another thing we were talking about pre-record is maybe this is something that you can only recognize back in retrospect and maybe we're living through rock bottom right now um obviously not 
not represented by like a crash in the stock market or anything like that, but um, just in, again, like overall mental health of society and the health of the, the family balance sheet and stuff like that. Maybe we'll look back in retrospect and be like, ah, this was either the beginning, middle or end of that, and that sort of uh, calamity. Yeah. Yeah. It's really hard to tell where we're at because I think over the past decade, we, we, <laughs> we've gotten this influx of new technology, new communication patterns. I mean, think about the amount that we use Twitter on a daily basis. Like, it scares me the, the amount that I want to use Twitter. Um, I'm bad, bro. Huh? I'm real bad. <laughs> you see me in my corner here. You see, this is, this is me all day. <laughs> Just in this corner. It's, it's, it's really, really hard not to be because it's such fierce stimulation and the content is genuinely so interesting and like we're going out and we're you know reading everything these other bitcoiners are doing and it it genuinely is uh uh meaningful and stimulating but it's it's this mode of consumption too and you can just sit there and scroll and scroll and scroll and a lot of people do this and i've even noticed in myself that production becomes much harder because it used to be when i was when i was a kid um, you know, I'd sit down and write something. I'd write a journal entry. I'd write a, a program, and I'd get a big dopamine hit out of that because creation is fun and it feels good. But when you're reading Twitter, you can kind of get some of those similar feelings. You can feel like you're doing something, feel like you're being productive, uh, without producing anything at all. And um, so it's it's a little bit scary, and I and I kind of wonder about how that balance breaks down. Yeah, maybe let me get a little pushback here, but like maybe the participation of that is helping create a hive mind, right? I think that's like. That's one of been one of my biggest uh, lines about Twitter. It's like a huge empathy creation tool. And yes. Part of that empathy creation is, uh, or empathy creation is probably part uh, part parcel on the way to becoming like a hive mind like society. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, hive mind to me sounds a little bit scary, but I think I know what you're getting at. Yeah. Which is a sort of more fluid and liquid consciousness. Yes. That that people share, um, and I think that's great. And and I don't want to sound like a luddite. I. I don't want to go back to a time before Twitter because I think we can't. It's here. It's, you know, in the same way that Bitcoin has been discovered, it's Pandora's box has been opened and we just have to adapt to the new world. Yeah. And and, and Twitter, too, like I would argue it's better. Right? It's provided me and I would I would not be here right now without Twitter. Like this podcast would not. Yes, yeah, totally. My newsletter would not exist without yeah. Twitter. Like uh, this podcast literally would not exist if I did not DM somebody on Twitter. and was like, you should not be shilling Ethereum to Barstool audience yeah. And yeah that's how this started and like but it is you have it is I'm trying to think of an analogy but it's it's like such a powerful tool that you have to learn how to like tame your your interaction with it it is sort of like like bitcoin for communication you know i mean it, oh, yeah. it, it completely it's like a hayekian distribution network of of ideas and thoughts and 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 your merit has allowed you to basically start with nothing and become you know marty from tftc and so uh, I think that's a beautiful thing. And, and uh, yeah, I think you're right that there's there's a whole lot of good that's going on. I think in general the way that I would characterize our times is that w- we live in very interesting times as the Chinese proverb goes and, and some crazy things are happening with the monetary system. But the saving grace is that we have these technological tools now that are being discovered and created actively that allow us to take back some of the individual's autonomy and to really um, try and try and make a good future for ourselves. So I'm excited about that. I am as well. I'm happy to be on the front lines uh, trying to make Bitcoin become a thing. Or it already is a thing. Trying to make it become successful. It already is successful. Trying to make other people realize that they need it. There we go. Um, we're almost two hours in here. It's been incredible. Holy cow. been an incredible time as always. Um, I guess let's end it here. Uh, what, what any parting notes, parting thoughts, parting ponderings do you have for the freaks out there? Uh, I hope this wasn't too uh, sporadic of a journey for you freaks. Uh, they love the sp- sporadicness. Cool, yeah. At least I, mean, I do. How do you, are are you okay with being the Joe Rogan of uh, the, the Bitcoin podcast uh, game? I don't, I don't, I don't think I deserve that title, but. Um, I think you do, if, if anything, I think you surpass Joe, like the Joe Rogan equivalent because Joe's cool, but he, he's very hit or miss and he's very marketing-y and I think you're, you're none of those, so. Um, Appreciate the kind words, James. I'm a big fan. I'm really, I'm really just um, saying all these nice things to Marty so that he'll give me one of his cool hats that he's just <laughs> made. Uh, if if you don't know what cool hat I'm talking about, go to the 
recently released uh, Tales from the Crypt website? Uh, by the time this episode's posted, yes, this will this will be a true right? statement. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm. A, yeah. I think they might be sold out by the time. That's a good point. That's a good point. But check anyway. Actually, I'm thinking about launching this today. But well, you know, take your time. This might be an make inch. it right. Yeah, I should make it right. Um, got a lot. Yeah, free freaks out there who aren't aware. I got a lot of inventory in the docket, so we might be getting three episodes a week for the next couple of months. So, um, James, it's always a pleasure sitting down with a fellow beefy Bitcoin boy pondering about Bitcoin in the world. I'm overall optimistic. If this came off as a pessimistic conversation, just gloss over that. We're we're overall optimistic, I would argue, and I think it's because we finally have a common mission, which is Bitcoin, uh, which provides an optimistic view of the future couldn't have said it better myself marty always good to be on the pod well can't wait to do it again soon peace and love freaks